All right. We will call this meeting to order. Mm -hmm. And we will now um, establish a quorum by calling the roll. Are you ready, Ms. Alley? Yes. Okay. Mr. Burkhart? Here. Mr. Carrington? Here. Mr. Shepard? Here. Ms. Joseph? Here. I will also like you all to know that Mr. Herrick is here um, representing the county attorneys. And we have Mr. Svoboda is here, the uh, zoning administrator. Mr. Bowling is here, and he uh, is the attorney to the Board of Zoning Appeals. I don't see Francis. Um, and Ms. Alley is here as our clerk. Um, there are a bunch of faces down. Oh, Lisa. Lisa Green is here um, representing the county. Um, and I don't, if you all are down there representing the county, I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. So <laughs> at this point in time, we will move on to the public mm -hmm. hearing. The public hearing is AP 2023-0003, Costa Lake, LLC. The appellant is Dominique, is that right? Dominic, Postalak, Postalak, okay. Um, property owner is Costa Lake uh, LLC, Dominique, uh, Kustalak, manager, and I probably said it wrong the second time, but forgive me. It's tax map, uh, parcel ID is 079C0000001000. And the staff person who will represent uh, the county is Mr. Bart Svoboda. And this is how this is going to work. Uh, Mr. Svoboda um, and or Mr. Herrick will comment and um, answer questions if questions are asked for 15 minutes. And then the appellant will have another 15 minutes to speak. Anyone from the public then will be able to speak after that. And then there is a five minute rebuttal for both the county and the appellant. Okay? Okay, Mr. Svoboda, would you please begin? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chair Joseph. My presentation should be brief as all the facts in the case are laid out in the staff report. Once I've finished, I will take any questions that you may have. Uh, as stated, this is Appeal 2023-001. It is uh, regarding a notice of violation. It is NOV 2023-109. Uh, this is a map of the property. This is just off our uh, real estate records, our GIS. Gives you an idea of the location. This is uh, the with the zoning layer turned on, and you can see the, the difference in color uh, where this property is zoned PRD as the current zoning district. Um, under an, an appeal, what we're here to do is is determine, and I know you all have seen these slides before, but this is uh, Virginia Code Section 15.2-2309, and we're here to determine whether or not the zoning administrator has applied the zoning ordinance correctly in this particular case. Here's a brief history of the parcel. In 1978, the property was rezoned from straight agriculture to uh, PRNA1. That's listed in your, it is in your packet. So there's a lot of attachments with this. And what I'm trying not to do in my presentation is run through the gauntlet of those attachments. So there'll be some references. If you have questions about that, you can um, let me know. So attachment C is the uh, rezoning letter. And 2014, the Virginia Land Company did place a perpetual open space easement on the parcel. Um, Dr. Charles Hurt, which is Virginia Land Company, actually is the one that did the rezoning also. Um, let me break for a minute. There were three letters that were sent to you. I want to make sure that everybody got those. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
and that since the time the packet went out. So in the last few days, you guys received those. In 2015, Virginia Land Trust submitted and the county approved a boundary line adjustment. The reason this is relevant for the appeal is the notes on that plat indicate that the property is zoned PRD and it is not located in the agricultural forest district. So that's just establishing history of the parcel and verification that of the current zoning district. And that it is known by, was known by the owner at the time uh, they had to sign the plat. In 2022, the Albemarle County Conservation Easement Authority holder, uh, which is it's our ace easement, uh, approved a harvest plan for this. Uh, the reason I bring this up is the property does have an easement over the top of it for conservation. It does comply with the comprehensive plan for a rural area. However, the zoning designation is PRD and civil culture or timbering is not a permitted use in the PRD. So an easement, just like any other easement, <clears throat> um, can be more restrictive than the underlying zoning, but not less, meaning an easement can't grant permissions that the ordinance doesn't allow on a property. I'll briefly run through the um, appellant's arguments. Appellant's first argument is an attempt to invoke a vested right on a use that is no longer permitted in the PRD zoning district. Um, that use was not established, so there's no vested right there. Also, the current property owner, Mr. Kostelak, did not take possession of the property until recently, so there is no affirmative governmental action that vested with that purchase of the property. So, and by the applicant's only own admission, he merely relies on the previous zoning classification, kind of that no longer exists. Mm -hmm. So when the property was rezoned, all those previous uses that were permitted, or if there's an ordinance revision, any uses that are added or subtracted from that, um, either are permitted or become void. The appellant's second argument claims a, a vested right associated with an open space easement that encumbers the property. Um, there's no disagreement, as I previously stated, that there is an open space limit that limits the use of the property. However, that does not un overrule any underlying um, zoning district. Although the Conservation Easement Authority did approve a timbering plan, they would still need zoning permission to do that, just as if the conservation easement has to approve a, a house or a barn or whatever the conditions are within that easement, whether or not that particular use or structure is permitted under the easement, or under the zoning would still have to be approved. The appellant's third argument is that mobile tools such as tractors, hay wagons, two trucks, and harvesting equipment are the same as manufactured buildings or structures. <clears throat> so I want to apologize. One of the things I failed to do was run through the notice of violation. If you're all familiar with that, then I won't, won't go through those items. One of the items listed was a stockpile of materials, axles, tires. Um, we deemed that a junkyard. And the argument there is, or excuse me, that was one. And the other is buildings located on the parcel without the appropriate permits. Mr. Svoboda, just for the record, if anyone wants to go and listen to this tape, you probably should go through each, each one of okay. the violations, please. So the notice, which is VIO 2023-109, that trees were being cut that were not dead or dying that are greater than six inches and there was no established use. <clears throat> the storage of structures on this parcel is not permitted. The accumulation of tires and car parts on the parcel constitutes a junkyard and is a use not permitted. And that manufactured homes stored on this parcel, not on a foundation, require required by the building code 
are not being used as a primary residence. So in kind of English, what we did is we have trees that were cut without an approved site plan, because this is an other than RA parcel. There's accumulation of tires and car parts, which constitutes a junkyard. And regarding the structures, whether they're a mobile home or a storage structure, they would require permits. May I ask a question, please? Yes, sir. What was it that initiated the, the complaint to begin with? Uh, one of the uh, area residents had called in a complaint. They heard noise and bulldozers, what sounded like bulldozers to them. So uh, our process is you call the complaint line. Uh, the complaint is logged. We send a CCO out, code compliance officer out to do an investigation. If a complaint is, is validated, then we notify the property owner. If a complaint is found to be unfounded, then we would mark it unfounded and be done with it. Thank you. Yes, sir. So mobile tools such as tractors, hay wagons, two trucks, and harvesting equipment uh, are the same as a manufactured building or structure. So the, uh, the zoning administrator does disagree with that and that a structure is a structure. Whether I have wheels on it or not, it is not a, a piece of equipment. So that particular, um, when we talk about the structures or buildings, those would require permits. It's not that they're not allowed to be there. It's that they would need the appropriate permits to be located on the property. And it's Pellant's final argument is that the zoning administrator was erred in classifying tires and car parts as junk and states that these items are required parts for the mobile agricultural devices. <clears throat> Again, the PRD zoning district does not permit agriculture. If, if the parts were for agriculture, um, that use is not permitted, so it wouldn't be allowed. So there's no accessory use related to that. Also, in one of the letters that came in, I believe on Friday or Saturday, it does talk about the parts that are located. So there's no dispute that those things are located on the property. Um, and I believe in that particular, it was referenced that some repairs or different things would need to pl take place um, to have those things functioning again. So in that particular case, we then consider that uh, junk or discarded material or material material awaiting repair, which is similar to in an operable vehicle. So in in that particular case, um, again, the storage of, of of parts is not a permitted use. <clears throat> Though the appellant may feel that agriculture or civil culture should be allowed on the parcel with an open space easement, the property is not zoned for an agricultural or civil cultural use. So again, the easement, you have to comply with the easement conditions, but you have to also have to apply with the underlying zoning districts. And that's stated in a number of documents through the history, including the plat. By the, uh, by the appellant's own admission and with photographic evidence, the cutting of trees has taken place. There are structures, tires, parts located on the property. The activity on the property at the time of the notice of violation was not a permitted use by right in the PRZ's D zoning district. So the ability to have that use um, in the A1 zoning district, uh, the applicant could seek a remedy of a rezoning and apply for rezoning and that would allow for agriculture. Again, with the conservation easement, the comprehensive plan designates this area as rural. But the, as we know, the comprehensive plan <clears throat> does not rezone property. So I move that the Board of Zoning Appeals adopt the attachment decision, attachment M, affirming the zoning administrators official determination. Mm -hmm. That concludes my report. Uh, again, the, the packet is pretty thick. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Svoboda at this time? I just have an, and just, just one quick question. You're talking about uh, putting in a request in for maybe rezoning. 
Uh, the, the, okay. And that would go to the board of supervisors, obviously, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so what is the timeline in the event that uh, the appellant wants to go that route? From the time they put the request in and then the public hearing is done, what's, what's that timeline that they'd be looking at? In this particular case, uh, this one would probably run faster than say one that was going to have like a 500 unit subdivision because we're going where it's not really about development. So based on advertising and things, somewhere probably between six months and eight months, I would think it might go faster than that. Mr. Kostelak and I have ha had those conversations. All right. Thank you. Um, I have several questions. Is the quote storage of structures a use as defined in the code? No. No, so I can't without I can't store a structure there. <laughs> I can build a structure there. So having a structure on the property is not the same as storing one. So but, it, but is storage of structures a, permit, a use? It is not a use permitted. Is it a use? It is a use in a commercial district where I store structures for sale, like sheds. So it's, or def mobile it's homes. a defined use. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, in the zoning staff's review of a site plan, uh, would it would zoning staff reject a site plan if it conflicted with a con conservation easement? As part of the review of the site plan, we would ask the easement holder, in this particular case, uh, the county, um, whether or not the use complied. And if it didn't comply, as the easement holder, they would have to grant permission for that use over the property, and they would basically be part of the application. So without both the easement holder and the property owner's approval, we wouldn't be able to proceed forward. It'd be similar to if a deck, for instance, went into a service authority easement without permission from the easement holder for a deck to encroach or used to be in that easement as part of the agreement, we would <laughs> deny the, the zoning approval. Okay, thank you. And just to clarify, even if that easement holder was not the county, if it was VOF, for example, you would still check with the easement holder? Yes. Okay. Um, last question. Uh, does the ownership change have any impact on a non-conforming use. Um, so if a non-conforming use exists, it doesn't lapse for two years, but the ownership changes, um, would zoning staff issue a violation because that non-conforming use changed ownership? No, no, non-conforming uses do not expire on ownership change. Okay. That's all I have. Any other questions? No. Thank you. We good? Good. Okay. Now it is time. Um, the appellant, Mr. Kostalak, would you like to present whatever information you may have to help us make this decision? Is this working okay? Okay. Sure. You can raise that. Is that working? It'll, it'll you can raise that if you like. How's that? Is, it? <laughs> is that better? Yeah, hear me okay. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks for uh, being with me here today. <clears throat> um, given that I only have 15 minutes to defend a significant amount of property rights, I'm going to have to just uh, pretty much stay on track about this. i got a lot to cover here. Um, I ask you, you keep in mind these main points, and they're very salient. And I'm going to read the excerpts from these. Um, uh, you have the documents in front of you in the full form with annotation. But the courts are required to interpret statutes based on quote what is the stat what the statute says, and not by what the court <clears throat> thinks it should have said. Unquotes. Going on, the doctrine of judicial restraint dictates that we decide cases on the best and narrowest grounds available. Unquotes. <clears throat> Your task in statutory interpretation is to, quote, give reasonable effect to every word, unquote, <clears throat> in a statute. And we will not read a legislator enactment in a manner that renders any portion of that enactment useless, unquote. <clears throat> 
I have both, and I'm, I, I need to emphasize that, both a, uh, a right to continue agriculture as a non-conforming use and as a vested right on the subject property. Uh, <clears throat> when selling the zoning code to the citizens who lived in the for the hundreds, if not thousands, of the civilized years without one, the government made, the government here made a promise and codified it into law. They promised that the cur current use, whatever it was, would be grandfathered in, and that a landowner would need to take no action, seek no permit, nor application to continue on as usual. Documentation wasn't even required. The term is is codified as a continuation of non-conforming use. Here is the language of that. Here is the language that the county zoning department is remarkably silent on in the arguments. Uh, excuse me here. Uh, Non-conforming use means, and I'm excerpting this for the salient points, means a lawful principal use on a lot exist, existing on the effective date of the zoning regulations applicable in the district in which the use is located. That does not comply with the applicable use regulations of that zoning district. Going on, Section 6.2, a non-conforming use may continue. And, and Section E, a change in ownership of the occupancy of a non-conforming use shall not affect the status of the non-conforming use. Going on, as, as regards to discontinuance, mm -hmm. Section G, a non-conforming use and all uses shall be discontinued, uh, shall be discontinued, and a non-conforming use is discontinued for, if the non-conforming use is discontinued for more than two years. Uh, we will touch on all of these points. The property is unique in that it has had one owner since before there was any zoning on this property. Dr. Hurt bought this property in the early 1970s and has continuously maintained a, this silver culture crop. He submitted a letter which puts the matter in perspective, which I would le like to read aloud, at least the excerpted parts. I, Dr. Dr. Charles Hurt have, and it's attached in the back. I, Dr. Charles Hurt have owned this property since the mid 1970s and recently sold to Mr. Costalac or Costalac, Castellac LLC. The adjacent lake is even named after me, Hurt Lake. As regards to the family history of this parcel, I have never had a site plan approved for this property, but I have continuously managed the silviculture and agriculture assets that existed there. I have long incorporated silviculture into the properties my properties beginning as far back as the mid 1950s. And I'm fully aware of the value of timber as a crop. On this parcel, I have stewarded these trees continuously for almost 60 years, paying taxes and maintaining access roads until the present day. Additionally, I carefully included the preservation of agriculture and silviculture in the conservation easement I created in 2014. I've worked carefully with the Al Albemarle County attorneys and land use experts to preserve the agriculture and silviculture assets. And in no time was it ever asserted that I would be barred from harvesting this crop. This crop of this, the value of this crop is, was an important aspect to the sale of Mr. Mr. Kostelak. And he wrote that July 7th <clears throat> and then going on, this entire property is covered with a crop in existence for 100 years. If this crop was continuously planted in corn, we would not be having this discussion but certain crops have no value in one season. White oak from mature, not free forest is the cornerstone of the Virginia wine and spirits industry is barrels. That's where this wood is going. There are no barrels made of 20 year old oaks. You need perfect old growth, not free trunks that only develop over very long cycles. While this crop was maturing, Dr. Hurt witnessed a procession of zoning classifications. <clears throat> At the beginning, there was no zoning. 360 years of it in Virginia history. Number two, in 1960, it was designated A1, meaning agriculture with a limited amount of home sites. Number three, another phase, an undetermined category where suburban sprawl, similar to the Hessian Heights neighborhood, and that was circa 1972 to 75 per the county map. Number four, and this is an application made in 1977-78, is A1 slash PRPN, which included both agriculture and a right to increase home density. In, in somewhere around 1980, the county removed the agricultural from all PRN zone properties. Dr. Hurt never abandoned his agricultural use, either as a vested or non-conforming use, which he passed on to me in the sale. I'm continuing to maintain its non-conforming and vested agricultural status. And number six, at some point through the adoption of the comprehensive plan, the county now designates its future use as RA, rural agriculture, desiring to see agricultural activities take place there. What a chaos of central planning does this print present to someone who holds a property for 60 years? 
This highly valuable crop of ancient white oak covering the entire property is, per is the perfect definition of a preserved non-conforming use with no two-year lapse. As to the preservation of the vested right of agriculture, when Dr. Hurd applied <clears throat> and received a rezoning in 1977, there was no dispute that the category included architecture, our agriculture. In fact, the zoning application was not just PRN, but A1 slash PRN, clearly memorializing that agriculture was part of the project. He received an approval for a zoning category and not a specific project. No site plan was ever approved, even though many were contemplated and discussed with planning authorities. The property may have been subdivided for two homes or many homes, but it could be subdivided into two farms or many farms. Both were vested rights. A farm property may include a home, but does not require the services of home if none is constructed or desired. Dr. Hurt voluntarily put a conservation easement, limiting the number of homes or farms as a benefit to the public and county. After all, the county, after all, the county now wants it to be RA and have agriculture activities on the land. Dr. Hurt only agreed to limit the subdivisions to a maximum of 39 with no minimum in the original application. There was no prohibition to create less subdivisions and specifically to the amount to be supported by conventional septic and existing roads. The county and other authorities did approve one home slash farm on the adjacent 26 acre lot that is supported by an unexpanded VDOT road system and a conventional septic system. This was done without an amended zoning or obtaining a site plan because no, plan, no site plan is required for a single family home or an agricultural use. Going on, clearly agricultural use is preserved by both a vested right and the continuing non-conforming use. The failure of one path does not distinguish, does not extinguish the other. Moving on to the second ac ac accusation in the determination, determination letter that the storage of structures is not a permitted use. First and more importantly, let's look at the definition of a structure. <clears throat> A structure means an assembly of materials forming a construction for use and other structures of this general nature. And they, they create a list to help you. Stadiums, circus tents, reviewing stands, platform stagings, observation towers, water tanks, underground storage tanks, trestles, swimming pools, amusement devices. Not one of the named, quote, structures in the above list has wheels on it. To contemplate that structure means any assembly of materials forming a constructive Construction for use would create a meaning so broad as to include every object on earth. As such, it is not a limiting definition. A structure is not a car, a van, a truck, a trailer, or an RV, because these are not fixed to the earth in a meaningful way, as are all the items on the list. Wheel ve wheeled vehicles are not a, quote, structure of this general nature. A road-ready wheeled tool slash device is not a structure. Is it the position of the county zoning staff that vacant property cannot have a vehicle on it. What is the pickup truck? Is it a farm structure? What is a landscape trailer or a box truck with nothing in it? Is it a building? Is it a structure? <laughs> Additionally, if there's a failure to confirm agriculture as a preserved use, both the 1975 code and the 1980 code for PRRPN allow park and recreational facilities. We certainly have a lake and a beach and could assert a right to have a canoe storage or paddle transport vehicle on the property. Exactly nothing is currently in the wheeled personal property at present to define it. The above use holds as a right, notwithstanding any failure to preserve an agricultural use. Will we now debate that the lake is not a recreational fee facility with a two year lapse of a recreational canoe activity? That's absurd. Moving on to the accusation of a junkyard. Number three, the accumulation of tires and car parts in is in error. These new or used spare tires and axles are a required companion to these mobile carts or devices as they are routinely required part replacements when being moved along the roadway. Sp such specialized parts are hard to find and must be immediately available when needed. Parts adjacent to the job at hand do not a junkyard make. Per the definition below, junk means any scrap, discarded, dismantled, or inoperable. And some of the citations are vehicles, furniture, construction equipment. Junk only refers to discarded, dismantled, inoperable vehicles, furniture, construction materials, etc. Not the routine care of non-discarded, non-dismantled, fully operational vehicles, furniture, construction, etc. To construe a junk, con to construe junk as an item in the routine possession of maintenance and use is unconscionable. Here are some short excerpts from Witness Joe Page. 
I will testify that the items in question were highway certified and travel with all necessary brakes, lights, and licenses to the property. In moving these items, we did have a problem with tire blowouts and damaged axles, which we temporarily set aside on the set aside on the property. To call this small handful of items set aside for the repair a junkyard is beyond disingenuous. As a fellow citizen within Albemarle County, I am very concerned that this kind of violation of privacy, ethics, common sense, and abuse of power is being perpetrated on under mem another member of our community. And lastly, the fourth acquisition is there is a manufactured home in the property. There is no manufactured home in the property. The counter never examines the definition. I will certainly read it here. The term manufactured home means a structure designed to be used as a single family dwelling with or without a permanent foundation and includes the plumbing, heating, air conditioning, and electrical, electrical systems contained in the structure. The zoning, depart, the zoning department has never identified, photographed, or otherwise determined any such item. None of those key inclusions are found in any of the wheeled property in question. To recap, number one, the property is has, re, has retained agricultural use by vesting or by non-conforming use. As such, cutting of trees are allowed by law. Number two, the storage of structures is an erroneous charge in that those undefined wheel devices slash properties are not, are allowed through an agriculture use or separately as a wheeled vehicle, as wheeled vehicles are simply not to be classified as a structure. Number three, there is no junk or junk yards. Items on the property do not fall within the definition of junk and are not accumulated in a junkyard by definition. And number four, there are no manufactured homes on the property. The county has no evidence that anything on the property matches the legal definition. But stepping back for a moment, the BZA must consider all the laws in the zoning code, the county code, the Virginia code, and the constitution. Additionally, no law can come in con conflict with the constitution and the board also retains the right as does the jury to reject the law itself. Below are in some important understandings. These items in question are deep within the private 40 acre parcel with no trespassing signs in the security gate. All pictures were taken in violation of the fourth amendment. The BZA must consider violations of law by the staff when hearing a case inclusive of whether evidence was gathered through a violation of law. That came down recently per Judge Lisa Lorish of June 13th, 2003 in a similar BZA case. And she writes in her opinion, in declining to follow the statutory requirements, the BZA committed a mistake of law and therefore abused its discretion. She goes on. Additionally, all zoning, and this you have to see it from a higher level, all zoning is an unconstitutional taking. Anyone can read and understand the following in the Fifth Amendment. This is the highest law of the land, up, up below which all laws are subordinate. And I shall excerpt, no person shall be proper deprived of property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Individuals on the BZA court, on the BZA board can continue this theft or assert the right of any jury to reject the law itself. When good people remain silent, the tyrannical will continue to contort the law of the land, which asserts that all men are created equal. None has any more right to take a thing by force than another. No one can de delegate a power they do not have. The Constitution binds the government against these violations of both articulated and unarticulated rights of the people as individuals, not as a group. As, the, as to articulated rights, let's reread the above words in the Constitution and hold them in your mind carefully. No person shall be deprived of property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Remember that this county maintained that no black man has any rights a white man ought to respect for a hundred years after this constitution was written. I'm not in possession of a bundle of sticks that you, such that you can take all but one stick and classify it as not theft. If you believe that I am free to take anything you have but a penny, well, then let's agree that no taking has, take, has occurred and no robbery has taken place. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mr. I forgot your name. <clears throat> Mr. Kostelek? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, thank you. Oh. We have no questions. Okay. Oh, you Thanks. do have one? Have okay. Um, Mr. Kostelek, do you have any, um, we've heard a lot about the passive growth of trees and, and we can talk Hello? more about definitions of, of agriculture and 
silviculture. Um, but do you have any evidence to illustrate any sort of active management of the timber? Well, I gave you his letter directly. And so remember, in the assertion of a non-conforming use, there was no burden on the prop on the property owners to keep special records in case that they're interrogated in the future. Remember, the zoning code was precariously thrust upon the people and there was a negotiation. And they told everybody that you didn't have to do anything and you can maintain it. And so I, I want you to examine that point very carefully. We have we have various maps of flyovers that take mm -hmm. place. You can look at a property from the 1930s, flyovers, 1950s, et cetera. If we are looking at a crop of corn, soybeans or something like that, and you can see that crop regularly there over the years, you'd be saying, well, we have no problem with that. But for those people who are in the silviculture business, who actually, when I say business, you don't have to be in the business of silviculture to be in agriculture. Understood. That if you flew over that property, you will always be seeing trees because we have the uh, uh, forestry reports. They say that the trees are at their perfect maturity at 60 to 100 years before they go into a state of decline you have to wait that long to get the kind of trees that are valuable to the wine industry. Right. So it's Thank that you. that's a crop. It's not <clears throat> indistinguishable from a lettuce head. Thank you very much. I have one question. Um, in the sale of the property to you by um, Mr. Hurt, yep. um, obviously you had discussions about some of the selling features of the property, things that obviously uh, were of interest to you. Uh, what, what, unless it's uh, memorialized somewhere in written form, just generally, what, 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 how is this described to you in terms of any expectation that what had done in the past would grandfather uh, through the future with your ownership of the property? Well, uh, first of all, <laughs> we can really read the code itself. I don't think whatever anyone would say to me would somehow trump the actual written code as it exists. I don't need to have that conversation to understand how the law practices itself. We do understand, and, uh, and this has come up many times before, I've been in agriculture. In fact, I was in front of this board 10 years ago arguing about the um, agriculture that we had. And um, we have continued to be in agriculture ever since. And uh, unfortunately, in my case, uh, the county has disregarded the, um, the wild food harvesting that we do, and we've turned that into a, a spectacular company. But the truth Mr. is- Mr. Costello, FDA, please just answer the well, question. Well, I, I, I am, uh, but I want to go back and I'll try to focus it more. Um, the conversations were vast, and, and and I can't recall all of them, but I don't think that we had to touch on the transfer of any uses because I'm and he both understand the law very carefully, and and in fact, and he continues to be shocked about this because this whole process of him doing it was engagement with the county and stuff. <clears throat> uh, the attorneys uh, they're very participatory in this. They were involved in many email strings, and the unfortunate thing is that it's surprising to me that a single phone call can come into the county and all of a sudden they have an epiphany of law that seems to be lapsed in every okay. encounter. Okay, that, you're, you're going on uh, here. Yeah. You need to just answer that question. Thank you. Okay, anything more? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there any a member of the public that would like to speak to this? Question. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, Mr. Kost you have a question for Mr. Kostelak? A question for Mark. Where would, that, where would that fit in? Not now. Okay. There are no members. Okay. Uh, there are no members on the list from the public. Is there any anybody who didn't sign up that would like to speak to this item? Okay. If not, uh, we will bring it back for rebuttal time. Mr. Herrick, would you like to <clears throat> let us know what you're thinking in five minutes? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Andy Herrick with the Albemarle County Attorney's Office. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I'd like to just address a few of the points that Mr. Kostelak raised during his argument and to try to rebut them. Um, first of all, uh, in order to establish a legal non-conforming use, there has to be a continuous usage of the property that's not discontinued for more than two years. And as we discussed in, in the case last year regarding the, the portable toilets, uh, in, in a separate case, as you'll recall, the burden of proof is on the applicant to establish a legal non-conforming use. And the reason for that, the reason that the law puts that burden of proof on the owner is because presumably they will have better records, a more thorough uh, documentation of what the use of the property has been through the years. I find it curious that, that Dr. Hurt's letter, and again, we have the utmost respect for Dr. Hurt, but it's interesting in reading the, the email, the brief email that he sent that in all of his properties, he's been about uh, timber management. But I think Mr. Carrington had a very salient question, which is, 
what specific evidence is there on this property of active timbering? And the answer is, is minimal. There's nothing in Dr. Hurt's uh, correspondence to suggest when, if ever, this property has actually been timbered. Has there been a forest management plan other than the one that Mr. Kostelak brought to the Conservation Easement Authority last year? Those would be the sorts of things. I acknowledge that, that there's not gonna be a timber harvest every year, but is, is, is there some sort of forest management plan? Is there any sort of timbering history on this property, on this property at all? And unless and until there's evidence of, of some sort of active timbering going on on this property, I think that the applicant has failed to, to meet its burden of proof um, to establish that there actually was forestry as a legal non-conforming use on this property. If anything, I would point the, the, uh, the board's attention to page nine of your packet, where Dr. Hurd himself sought the rezoning of this property from the old A1 zoning to a planned residential development. So if intent is any indicator, in 1978, Dr. Hurd himself was, was intending to convert this property from its existing use to a planned residential development. Now, somewhere between 1978 and when he sold it to, uh, to Mr. Kostelak, maybe there was a change in his plans. But at least in 1978, it seemed as though, you know, based on page nine, that Dr. Hurt did not have the intention of continuing this property as, as any sort of timbering use. So, so again, I don't think that uh, Mr. Kostelak has established uh, timbering as a legal non-conforming use. I also want to respond to the argument that the county has somehow approved a timbering plan for this property. I'd call to your attention that uh, the uh, conservation easement that exists on this property is held by the Albemarle Conservation Easement Authority, not by the county. And so when the Conservation Easement Authority uh, blessed the timbering plan that Mr. Kostelak brought before them, that was not county approval. That was saying that as far as the Conservation Easement Authority was concerned, that the timbering plan was consistent with the conservation easement. That's, that is not sufficient to address the zoning ordinance. The Conservation Easement Authority has no jurisdiction over interpretation of the zoning ordinance. So just because it passes the standards of a conservation easement doesn't necessarily mean um, that it meets the standards of the zoning ordinance. Because again, the Conservation Easement Authority is without authority to, to grant uh, any sort of permission to use a property in violation of the zoning ordinance. Uh, Mr. Kostelak has, has questioned the county's entry on the property. There are pictures uh, in the staff report that show the dismantled parts um, that exist on the property. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Kostelak acknowledged that part of the definition uh, includes dismantled. You can see uh, in the staff report, there are pictures of dismantled parts on the property. Uh, regardless of, of how stacked they may seem, that doesn't make it a use permitted. Um, Mr. Svoboda can clarify how the um, how the code enforcement officers entered the property. It's my understanding from what Mr. Uh, Svoboda tells me uh, that there were in fact that the property was not posted as no, no trespassing at the time that the code enforcement officers entered. I, I'm sure that Mr. Svoboda can, can clarify exactly what sort of signage there was at the time that the, that the county code enforcement officers went on the property. Um, I think that this was um, pursuant to a, to a valid search uh, that showed there to be junk on the property. Uh, but again, our argument would be that uh, Mr. Kostlak has not established a legal non-conforming use, uh, forestry is a legal non-conforming use, um, and that the Conservation Easement Authority has not, uh, it did not and is not able to give permission to, to uh, uh, contravene the zoning ordinance. Um, so we believe that the uh, notice of violation was correctly issued and ought to be affirmed by the BZA. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Herrick at this time? <clears throat> No. All right. Thank you Thank all very you. much. I don't know if this is the right time to ask that. Let's have Mr. Yeah, Costello. No, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I, I am sorry. You're, we're not rebutting um, the attorney, but. Um, Mr. Kostelak, it's now it's time for Mr. Kostelak to, to give his five minutes of rebuttal. Um, I'm not starting yet. I have to gather my thoughts here. There's, I should take notes. Um, Mr. Kostelak, if you would please speak into your mic. I'm sorry? Please speak into your mic. Okay. Um, well, the important, uh, one of the most important salient points is, uh, is there or is there not an agricultural cr crop there? The um, Paul Haney, who did the uh, forest timbering plan, 
uh, defined it. This is one of the best crops he ever said. And when he was in his report, what do you do to uh, manage a crop like this? You do nothing. You, you actually let it go. If you can get access to it, which there is a we, there is a road there, uh, that is the fact that you um, have the crop and it's 80 <laughs> years old and 100 years old is not an accident. Okay, the uh, the approvals that he did receive um, did not. Uh, did not say that you had to build a house there. He he got a subdivision. He applied for a subdivision <clears throat> and subdivisions may, do not require that you build any homes there. They could be remained in forestry. They could, re, in fact, many of the the parcels on that area outside this in the, the Shadwell Road here to this day do not have a, a home built on them because people can elect to keep their uh, their parcels that they buy for investment in agriculture or in forestry. And so Dr. Hurt did by fact, it's no, nobody's disputing that there's a hundred year old trees there and that you don't have to cut the trees every year. The fact that you don't cut the trees means you're going to a different kind of a tree crop. And that's just one of the things you can retain while you're contemplating other possibilities. You don't have to take any particular action. When he says you have to actually document it or do something like that in this particular, if there was a, um, I think what he's speaking about and more precisely is if you had a crop of, um, of corn and you've let it uh, go for three years or something like that where you didn't plant anything and there's nothing there's an absence of a crop there well absolutely that would call a two-year lapse but the fact that there's 80 year 80 year old trees and 100 year old trees from end to end on this that establishes that the crop was continuously growing and the silver culture experts not not the county or anybody else the for, state forestry says this was a perfect crop and it received the highest value for a crop and you have to wait a long time and that's the only way to get to it and the, and the, this crop excuse me, this crop went from end to end of the property. Additionally, when he applied for the PRN at the time, it was agriculture was used. And so he did have that. He took no action after that point, notwithstanding many approaches, he may have considered other possibilities. He never pursued anything else. But the one thing he consistently did is that. Um, other, other things that he had talked about, about the parts, I mean, the absurdity, I think I've laid out that argument very carefully in my um in my uh, rebuttals that you just cannot say if you remove a nut from your car when you're replacing a tire or anything like that, that that becomes a junkyard. From the perspective of a citizen, when we hear our counties taking <laughs> these kinds of aggressive approaches, that if you if you um, remove a windshield wiper and you set it down on the property, these, these items uh, came to the property very shortly before uh, we were, uh, had this uh, visit from the county enforcement officer. We, this is part of what you do. You travel with those tires and axles in case you have an issue because there's a lot of weight in these things. If you have an axle problem on the, on the road, you're going to be killed. And I nearly was killed moving these things. It's important in my you know, approach to these things that we, we look for reusable assets and move them from a place where they're, where they're uh, not in demand anymore to another market. It's a great way to uh, do an end run and innovate around the cost of materials and labor in this market. <laughs> And so I have innovated with these on other things and made them, some of them into chicken coops and mobile things. I've got plenty of pictures, which I've showed to Mr. Sabota, and he concurred that this is, in fact, um, a very innovative way. And he, uh, you know, on other projects, conceded that this is something he was not aware of. I have not yet defined the use of those. But remember, I also said and pointed out that not only is agriculture preserved, roofs, but so is recreational mm -hmm. facility. We're on a lake there. We have a beach there. What would you think we're doing there? We could we could go into a whole regime of of waterfront activities. Um, so I mean, we I think the case is clear with the trees being that old. We absolutely have preserved that right. And um, what was the other last thing that he had said? I um, uh, can't quite think about uh, 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 parts. That's an obvious uh, foolishness. Um, uh, oh, in terms of the um, the access, you know, it's uh, it's it's not in this court that you'll you'll actually have a true uh, finding, but that. Remember, this is a gated property with a security code. It's written on all the documents for people of foresters to get in there. It's, it's very carefully because I've had these problems with the county before. This is a gated property. It's 40 years. It's 40 acres. We're in the center of the property. There's a no trespassing sign that has always been besides that. It is not possible that he just breezed by that without noticing the attempts that we had made to create privacy. And it's not particularly just because of this incident. It's just, it takes us a lot of time to rebut this stuff and very expensive to rebut this. The better thing is to rest on our privacy as best we can, because that is a preser preserved uh, a right within the constitution. You Thank you, Mr. Costello. <clears throat> okay, we are now going to close the public hearing. And 
I guess I should have done that before. <laughs> Public hearing is now closed. And the matter is before the board. Um, I know you had a question for Mr. Svoboda. Yes, John? I did. It was mostly clarified, but I think I'd like to just put a fine point on the question. It, it goes back to uh, your, your uh, discussion about the relationship between easements and county regulations. And I want to just sort of maybe put words in your mouth and, <clears throat> and ask you if this is okay, but that uh, a county, an easement cannot supersede a county regulation or zoning. Uh, it, in order to uh, make a determination about this property, even though it has an easement on it, would not control the county's uh, determination about how to proceed with it. You, so, you, you, my, my, my problem with it, had, with, with your uh, original comment, if I understood it right, you were saying that we would, be, that the county would be required to uh, consult with the easement holder and get an agreement from them before enforcing county codes. Mm -hmm. Clarifying that would be good for me. Yeah, so for the first part, uh, correct. Uh, an easement cannot uh, overrule, override, or rezone a piece of property. So use that's not permitted in the zoning district can't be added by easement. Um, as far as process goes, um, if there's an easement, and so we will, uh, and I'll use a simpler example, like a building permit. If there's an easement on a piece of property and the structure encroaches into that particular easement, um, we would deny zoning approval for that until the easement holder gave permission. That being said, the use still meets all the zoning requirements, meaning it meets setback. <clears throat> it's a use that's permitted in the district. It does everything that it's supposed to do. So the easement isn't preventing or isn't giving permission to do anything extra. It's just a place to stay out of. So we wouldn't we wouldn't approve, which is kind of a backwards example, I, I would admit, for this particular case. If the easement said you could have a duplex on a particular piece of property um, and the property is not zoned for that, then zoning would deny it agreement with the easement holder or not, because the that particular the way that particular easement is written is it grants permission. In some of the older subdivisions that we have, we have um, easements or setbacks on plats that say 25 feet. In the rural area, it's 75 feet. So even though the HOA says you can do, build your house at 25 feet, zoning would not approve that particular structure until it reached the 75 foot setback. Does that, does that clarify that a little bit? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> you also had a question? Mr. Svoboda, but uh, does the structure that we have pictures of in our packet, um, is it served by any utilities? No, it is not. <clears throat> so therefore it does not fit the definition of a manufactured home, correct? Well, the the manufactured home definition that Mr. Kosselecker is different as I followed in our ordinance. And if, if I may, let me get there for one minute. Yeah, 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 down the
So in Article 31, 3.1, excuse me, of the zoning ordinance, uh, manufactured home, the term manufactured home means a structure subject to federal regulation, which is transportable in one or more sections is eight body feet or more in width. 40, mm -hmm. 40 body feet more in length and traveling and is 320 or more square feet uh, when erected on a site. There's some more that goes with that. Um, essentially, the difference between, say, a mobile home and a modular home is the label. A modular home is built to um, the state standard and the Virginia Statewide Building Code. A manufactured home is built to the HUD standard, which is a federal standard. And then there are manufactured structures or buildings which are like mobile office trailers, mm -hmm. mobile classrooms, different things like that. So the labeling on the, the specific structure um, is important. Um, any of those may or may not be permitted if there's a use that allows them. So any of those structures would require a, per a permit on a parcel of land. But, but you stopped short of a section in the middle of that definition that says, and includes plumbing, heating, air conditioning, and electrical systems contained in the structure. I'm curious as to whether you read a uh, a break in that definition that somehow um, separates the utilities from the definition of the yeah, structure. So, so within that definition, um, my understanding over the years has been is that's the installation of those components within the factory, not what it's hooked to on site. Um, so the, the manufactured home is assembled in a factory under the HUD standard. And so it ha could have electric plumbing, heating, air conditioning, whatever the federal code requires for that. So in some of the photos, it's hard to see. So there is wiring. There is a large, uh, looks like panel box or breaker box that's on the floor of one of those, but it is not installed mm -hmm. outside where it would have been. Um, Yeah, it says when connected to utilities. So also in that particular definition, um, there's a, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, make an interpretation on the definition here, sure. but th there's a clarifier there that talks about when connected to the required utilities and used as a single family, right? So meaning depending on how the structure is created, a mobile office trailer, for instance, won't have the same requirements mm -hmm. under the code as a residence and it may or may not be required to be hooked permanently to utilities so a single family home generally in all cases or a, ma a manufactured home once a permit is gotten then it'll be hooked to the utilities so mm -hmm. to say that the manufactured home um, from my perspective right to say that a manufactured home that the mobile home sitting on the lot at, at a mobile home dealer is not a mobile home I until I hook it to power or a septic system or to a sewer system, I believe is incorrect. If that, if that, <clears throat> if you're following me with the definition. Um, I think so. I, I just want to parse out one more thing because I think yes, it's sir. important. You referenced an office, a modular office um, structure. Um, is it your understanding that a modular office structure could be defined in the county ordinance as a manufactured home, even though there's language about it being designed to be used as a single family dwelling? No, it couldn't be defined as a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. All good. Thank you. Mr. Shepard, do you have questions? And just to uh, just to add to that just a little bit and to be super clear, the things that we're talking about right now are the pictures on page 79. It looks like two long structures, buildings with the- uh, Mr. Shepard, if you could speak in your mic. With, with, so we're <clears throat> referring to these pictures on page 79. Correct. Okay, with the uh, like the faux stone ends. All right. And along that line too, just the uh, when we're talking about the items that are stored on the property, 
uh, I don't see pictures here of the the structures, but I'm getting the idea that there are trailers or carts or something to move logs or other things. I don't, uh, picture's worth a thousand words, so I'd appreciate uh, just understanding what those things are. Do we have the inspector here who took the photos? <clears throat> yes, he's he's present. Would you like to ask the inspector those questions, Mr. Shepard? Yes. Whoever's, you know, in a position to uh, take it on. Yeah, the, the and Mr. Kosselak may be able to correct me if I'm wrong. Come on up. The, the, the items that you're looking at in the, those photos is what he's referring to as the carts and equipment and things, correct? I believe that's correct. Well, the picture I'm looking at here is, I think... Uh, he's right here. Oh, the pictures I'm looking at are just to get us on the same page. But I'm seeing about 13 tires and it looks like three axles. That's, I'm looking at that in the picture. Is there, could you put those into the, <clears throat> either separate those out or explain to me the relationship between those or are there other things on the property that aren't pictured here that were considered the structures? Thank you, Ms. Green. Could you go ahead and tell us who you are, Mr. Inspector? <laughs> um, hello, I'm Benjamin Cooper. I'm code compliance officer, just to clarify. Um, we're talking about the pictures on page 79. I'm looking right now. So uh, can you repeat the question again, just so I can answer are, it properly? Sorry. Okay, so I see... There's tires and three axles, and I think that's being referred to, that's the junk? That's not on page 79, though. That's on page 80. That's on page 80. Okay, there it is. And um, you just want me to speak to as where where they were in relation to the other? No, just, oh, sorry. I'm, John, I, I think you, your question is, was there anything else that you did not photograph that you could say <laughs> had some sort of connection to logging, whether it's a trailer or something else, or were these, do these pictures show everything that you saw out there that day? Those were, uh, those were the, the, every item that's in there was everything that I could visually see on the property <laughs> near, near the, uh, the roads that were uh, cut in for the logging. Okay, so any anything else that may be related to the logging enterprise? Um, not that I could see. It should be in the pictures. So what we see is what you saw. What you see is what I saw on the property. Okay. Yeah, and that was on the, the back end of the mm -hmm. where the trailers were. Okay. So, so the structures referred to in paragraph two of the staff's response to the appeal is the same building or whatever it is as the manufactured home stored on the parcel and not on a foundation. All, all the all showing on page 79, correct? Yes. Thank you. Okay. We good, Mr. Shepard? Yes. So the okay, so the things that were also <clears throat> talked about as mobile homes yes. are also structures stored on the property. Yes. One and the same. Yes. Same thing. For the, okay. Same thing. That clarifies it and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Uh, for the inspector, or for somebody uh, for the inspector, since you okay. were the first, you were the first-hand account out there. Um, so, in terms of the structure, um, uh, what would you did you measure? Do you know what the dimensions of the structure were? Was it sectional, and did do you know whether or not the total square footage was three hundred twenty feet, uh, more or less? Do you know? I did not measure the length of them. Uh, I it was uh, it was quite a few structure or. Uh, different separated uh, structures. Uh, I did take a picture trying to show the length um, of the structures there. Um, it's it's not just one structure, it's it's more than one and they're, they're stacked. And it looks like they're cutting uh, in the middle of them, in the middle of the structures. And I tried to take a picture to show that in there. 
uh, but the length I did not measure. Well, typically when I uh, when we have matters before the board, I like to drive on out and take a look at the property. I drove out yesterday and Mr. Koslyak had a had a private no trespassing sign with a gate across. Um, was that uh, was that visible to you when you went on the property? I entered the property from the Glenmore side and walked across the creek and went up the hill. Was that to circumvent the gate that you may have seen? No, I did not see the gate. Um, I was talking to the party that had made the initial complaint. I did not know the road went back there. Uh, and I, I, I did not know where anything was taking place. Uh, so I asked them for permission to go through their property to get onto that property. And I did not see any no trespassing signs when I went across. Okay, thank you. Just before you leave, were you looking for no trespassing signs? I always keep an eye out for it. And if I do see it, I include it in my pictures. Thank you. <clears throat> you didn't think this was going to happen to you today, <laughs> but thank you so much. Oh, no problem. At all. <laughs> thank you all. Any other questions? Okay. May I ask a question of the uh, appellant, please? Absolutely. Mr. Kostelak. Did... Uh, was this structure, did you did you bring the structure or was this on the property when you purchased it? Um, You've already explained the tires and the axle, but I'm curious about. Yes, I'd be happy to. I personally brought this to the structure myself mm -hmm. at great expense and great risk to myself. It was a very dangerous mission to bring these here. That these tires that you're looking at and things like that, they... We had six tire blowouts in the way from the other site to this, mm -hmm. and those tires had to move with it or we were dead. Those axles ha uh, have brakes attached to them. If we lose an axle, we bring those axles with us. Excuse yeah. me, Mr. Costalak, please speak into your mic. Uh, I'm sorry. It's please hard speak to hear into you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll repeat that. I'm sorry. <clears throat> yes. In fact, I did bring these at great expense and great risk to myself and Joe Page and other people who were involved in helping me move these that these things are moved at, at great weight and great expense and the tires will blow out at times. And it's a very life-threatening situation as you try to change these on the side of the road. We traveled with an entire armada of people who were supporting us with pickup trucks and tires and axles and every kind of tool because you cannot afford to have a situation on the highway with these things. And so these were attendant and necessary and had recently been there. Um, I have other things I would like to talk about, but you can ask me any more questions while I'm here. No, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Shepard, what are your thoughts? <clears throat> uh, so this is bringing it back to the board. I'm talking to so that. we're now bringing it to the board it now in, it's, and discuss. It is, yes, uh, it has been that way, yes. I think uh, regarding... The forestry. Uh, my uh, my take on that is uh, followed the staff report closely. Thought the staff report very thorough, comprehensive, and good. Uh, I think the key to this is the 1980 rezoning, uh, where in before the 1980 rezoning, although there, there was a lot of history with the parcel from no zoning to A1 zoning to PRN A1, those in the past, there was uh, forestry was permitted. The, in 1980, December 10th, 1980, that massive um, amendment of the, in fact, I think it was a replacement of the zoning ordinance with a new ordinance, uh, which established, which changed the PRN A1 to PRD. And PRD, uh, the PRD zoning did not permit by right or by special permit, agriculture, forestry, or silviculture. Uh, there's a part, uh, section, just to, to catch the code uh, citation on this, in uh, this, the December 10th, 1980 ordinance, 2.3, and I think this is uh, in, our, in the report, uh, 
it talks about if the new zoning ordinance con was in conflict with an old ordinance, that the new ordinance, uh, that, that the regulations in the new ordinance uh, would take whatever was the most stringent or severe requirement or standard would prevail. Uh, I, uh, I understand that at the time of the adoption of the December 10th, 1980 ordinance, that there was, uh, it was extremely controversial and viewed by many as a gigantic land taking. Uh, yes, it was. And viewed by people, and I think I could say that's an accurate assessment of that. And if you poke around in the land records in the courthouse, you will see a large number of subdivisions, a wave of subdivisions in late 1979, uh, getting parcels uh, in position for the new zoning so that they would, uh, you know, uh, assert their rights in the property going forward. Uh, so I think that's kind of the the where everything turned here. And I think a, a lot of what's being said about the agricultural use harkens back to the prior zoning and our basic understanding of the uh, the the allowance of forestry and farming in the rural areas. Uh, in December 10th, 1980, this is no longer a rural property and cutting trees, I think, would be subject to tree cutting 4.3, which requires, there's a lot of, you know, reasons why you can, why you can cut down a tree larger than six inches in diameter, but you'd need a zoning approval of that or the approval of a site plan or some other uh, positive action on the part of the county. Uh, just allowing the trees to continue, I don't think that's a, the right is vested. What could have been vested in the past, like the, all those subdivisors, subdividers in, right before December 10th, 1980, would have been to get an approved plan to, to do the forestry. Uh, that's my starting point. I think that the the staff position on uh, the lack of a vested right to do agriculture on this property uh, was lost on, uh, on December 10th, 1980, and was not asserted either by any kind of uh, definite plan or action. I'd also say this is more of an observation than a, uh, than a finding on my part. Uh, I think that Dr. Hurt and uh, Mr. Kosselak were did their as best they could, and as they knew, did good due diligence on the purchase of the property with the uh, with the conservation plan, and the fact that the distinguish that there wasn't a it wasn't distinguished uh, with in the course of uh, creating that easement that the easement would not override zoning, but that uh, it would control, but there were things that could that could be approved by zoning that would be in harmony with the easement, uh, but it, but the easement didn't overcome the zoning. The zoning got lost in the shuffle with that, it seems like. That's an observation. I can't really speak any more to the easement. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now. I'm a little confused about some of the things having to do with the uh, with the junk and the structure. I'm not rock solid in my thinking about that, but that's my starting point on the the forestry issue. Thanks. I got a couple. Yeah, I've got I've got a I've got a couple of thoughts on this. Um, I, I'm I guess I'm bothered by the fact that we have four violations and and a determination that we're asked to to vote on. Um, you take a look at our actions uh, that are presented to us. We've got, we can affirm the administrative determination. We can modify the administrative determination as follows, and that can be spelled out or reserves the administrative determination 
uh, reverses, excuse me, the administrative uh, determination on the following grounds. Um, following up with uh, with what Mr. Shepard said, uh, kind of reminds me of an indictment where you get, you know, ten charges and you hope one one sticks. Um, when I was asking the the um, the um, code enforcement inspector about access to the property, uh, the initial call was obviously bulldozers. Uh, we we hear something, county, do they have a permit? Can you tell us what's going on? Um, while uh, well, access to property, uh, according to what we just heard, has been by permission. Um, you know, the the county has access now to the property. They uh, they take a look at what's going on, and oh, by the way, uh, look at those tires and uh, look at the structure. And before you know it, you start adding up uh, additional violations. So, um, I'm just wondering whether, and I guess legal counsel here can help to, to an answer this. Whether or not these uh, these uh, these these four violations can be parsed out and acted on individually, or we have to, or if we have to take it in uh, it as the total package and vote it up, down, or or uh, make modifications as as we see fit. That's up to you, but I think it's I would you you can certainly consider them as a whole if that's what you want to do. Okay, uh, and uh, the um, the zoning administrator is charged under the zoning ordinance to do the best job he can. And so when he went out there and discovered something at that point, he doesn't have the really the luxury of saying, well, I discovered this and I discovered that and I'll just bring up this. He needs, he gives you what he discovers. And that's what he did here. Okay. I'm not Mr. a Bowling, speak if you could zoning administrator, but that's what it, it appears to me happen from reading the staff report. Mr. Bowling, if you could just pull your mic a little closer, that'd be great. How come you all have continually have this problem with the microphones? Why don't you dissolve, get a microphone? Because they're not close enough to the speakers. <laughs> I got you. And can you do, did you pick up what I said? Yes. Okay. Yes, we did get it. It was just faint. Pardon? Thank you for moving your microphone. You're welcome. I appreciate oh, well, it. Thank you, but I'm... Uh, I... <laughs> I'm uh, I'm finished. I believe he answered my question. I was just, but I, I, again, I'm troubled by the fact that we have four violations. When the, the I guess the 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 number one um, issue that really drove this whole thing was about bulldozers and trees coming down, um, and I have questions about whether this was a junkyard, whether or not this when you know is a manufactured home, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you know, I don't know in terms of voting on this. Uh, uh, and our actions by the board, uh, whether we take these up if we can separately or as as one package is presented. That's the question. That's up to the board. Mr. Carrington, what do you think? I have concerns about um, the right of entry, and I'm interested in Mr. Bowling's guidance, if he has any on um how well I'll start with whether this board should be concerned with how um, potential violations and evidence of those potential violations was gathered that's that's not an issue that I believe is before you today uh, and that's that's a separate issue entirely under the uh, fourth amendment and so forth and I'm sure if the applicant feels there's an issue he'll raise that but there's a different forum for doing that at this particular time than what's before you Understood. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go in reverse order uh, from the violations from number four back to number one um, to give the board my thoughts on this. The determination issues a violation for many quote manufactured homes stored on the parcel. Um, I don't think after examining the definition of a manufactured home that the structure constitutes a manufactured home. Um, so it would be my opinion that we modify that violation. Um, if we are going to parse these out as Mr. Burkhart suggested. Um, the determination also issues a violation for a junkyard use, quote junkyard. Uh, the definition of junk and junkyard leave a little bit of room for interpretation as to what constitutes quote discarded or some of the other words. Um, but I'm inclined to think that the photos do not illustrate a junkyard. I find that the materials are stacked neatly. They look like they could be stored for future your use and um, while that might be some sort of other violation, I don't think it's a junkyard or junk. Um, back to the second one, staff's determination says that the storage of structures is not a permitted use. I still am having trouble finding 
the term storage of structures uh, in the code. I, I find um, storage yard and I find structure, but I don't understand the use of a storage, a storage of structures use. Um, so I'm uh, maybe undecided on how we should, should um, parse that one out. Uh, and then to the first one, tree cutting, um, you know, with the with the vested non-conforming use, those three elements of significant governmental act, <clears throat> incurring obligations or expenses, um, and then the the part that is the crux of it for me is the diligent pursuit of a specific project. Um, and I don't think that the natural passive growth of trees constitutes an agricultural activity. Um, I mean, even the app, the appellant's chosen definition conflicts. I think which is, quote, the art and science of controlling the establishment, growth, composition, health, and quality of forests. It seems to me that silviculture is active, not passive. Um, so since no use was dil diligently pursued and continued without a two-year lapse, and the parcel is not zoned RA, I think the parcel is subject to the tree cutting provisions in section 4.3. Anything else? That's it. Okay. Um... I'm going to start with one, and I agree with what you just said, Mr. Carrington. If anyone's driven down Burkmar, they have seen some lovely old growth birches, or not birches, I'm not up north, beaches, mm -hmm. beaches and oaks, and those are all in growth areas. Those are all in areas that are zoned, I don't know, R6, R15, whatever, and they do need a site plan to come down. But I think that um, using the argument that we've been hearing, we could say, well, we've been just keeping that open for silviculture. Um, and maybe they're gonna be able to use those, but I, I just don't believe, I think that I, I tend to agree with the county's attorney that if you had been able to, Mr. Um, Kostelak, if you had been able to bring us documentation that showed from whatever, place um, Dr. Hurt started this, that there was um, an idea that this would be used to grow these oak trees, to create oak barrels for the wine industry. Okay, but I don't, I don't think that that's what's happening. I think that this land was, was empty and it was used. The other thing that I really wanted to see that could have kind of helped me figure out vesting or non-vesting was the actual plan for when this subdivision was created in 78 that showed a uh, designation. Is there annotation on the plan? Does it say anything about how these big parcels were to be used? I don't know. So if that's just the case and they're just these big parcels hanging out there, I, I cannot um, decide that active sil silviculture was going on there. Um, the structures, I think that one of the things that Mr. Svoboda said when we started talking about structures and storage, Mr. Svoboda, I think you referenced commercial areas that allow for storage of structures, whatever. Um, and it's usually outdoors and it's right. Um, and in <laughs> and when you're on the entrance corridor, they're they're severely um, regulated. So I, I think that that's where that structure, that storage of structures comes from. If you would tell me, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, the accumulation of tires and, and car parts. I understand what you're saying, uh, Mr. Carrington, that they look like they're in nice piles, but... Um, It's it's just sort of, to me, the beginning of something that could be happening. And I, I, I can consider it junk because the only thing that's been happening on this site is to cut down trees and to store stuff. So, um, so yeah, I, I would even consider some of these things that maybe aren't, maybe at some point were manufacturing homes junk. So that part, um, 
I can support the staff report, the staff's recommendations. I think this is one of the best staff reports I've ever seen. It is fantastic. I was able to read through it and understand everything. So thank you very much. Um, but that's kind of where, where I am at, at this point. So I don't know if anyone would like to suggest a motion, whether you want to modify some of these things, whether you want to um, take them out one by one and vote on them one by one. Mr. Bowling, is that something that we could do is just take them out one sure, by one? Sure, it sounds like you've decided to do it one-on-one. -on -one. I've just been sitting here listening to you. Okay. That, speak up if I'm wrong. That would be my preference um, to handle each violation separately because, um, you know, for instance, if the board felt like um, a certain one was going to be upheld and and um, and a different one was going to be um, overturned, the appellant would then, you know, not obviously uh, incur the expense potentially of of something that was overturned uh, of coming into compliance. Mr. Shepard, what are you thinking? Okay, uh, I think we'll be able to go through the list a little bit more quickly as we go along because I want to just say that I agree with Mr. Carrington and Ms. Joseph that the uh, the tree cutting is not protected by uh, is not a vested right that that right was lost in uh, December tenth, nineteen eighty. So I'm up, upholding the zoning administrator on that. The manufactured homes and the storage of structures, uh, I kind of view this slightly differently in that to me, they look like storage buildings that don't have building permits. I mean, don't have zoning permits. Uh, and if they were over whatever the limit, 256 square feet, I think you would need a building permit. Uh, I see, and I don't know, it's, uh, I mean, to me, they were they were there not. I'm making an assumption here, but not there to be stored, but to be used to store other things. Uh, so, I I agree that they are. So I'm going to say I uphold the zoning administrator by and large that those are not permitted as they are on the parcel right now, but it's just simply because they uh, they haven't gone through the zoning process to have a building like that on that property. And I'm in a quandary about calling those things junk. Uh, what what things are you referencing? The uh, the tires and the axle. Okay. I think in that, I mean, following my logic, if those things were inside what I'm calling storage buildings, <laughs> I would not think of them as junk. I would think of them as uh, stuff. And only the only thing that, and I hesitate to say this, uh, we, it, a storage, an accessory building has to be accessory to a primary use and i'm not sure what the primary use on the property is that, that would where where that would be permitted but for the sake of right now uh i'm going to leave it at that i'm not prepared to say whether that's junk or not but that's that's as far as i can get right now well you're going to have to get there mm -hmm. soon um, <laughs> I know I've, got a, I've got about four minutes and I'm thinking okay. about it. <laughs> okay. Um, is there any further discussion? Uh, would someone like to craft a motion? Why don't you take them one at a time yeah, so that we can be deal. clear what we're doing? Start with number one and then go down the list. I would if I could make a proposal. That's right. Yeah. Um, I'll make a motion to start with the easy one. Um, okay. Easier, I think. Okay. Uh, I move to affirm the zoning administrator's determination, which is VIO 
109, dated March 3rd, 2023, and being appealed as AP 2023-03, Cossie Lake, LLC, um, that trees that are not dead and greater than six inches in diameter are being cut on this parcel in violation of section 18, 4.3 tree cutting. Okay. Is there any discussion on the motion? We need a second first. Okay, that's right. Thank you. Is there a second? I second that. Okay, Mr. Shepard seconds. Now, is there any discussion? Good, okay. Ms. Ailey, would you please call the roll? Mr. Shepard? Aye. Mr. Burkhart? Aye. Mr. Carrington? Aye. Ms. Joseph? Aye. Okay. Mr. Carrington, are you willing to sort of figure out the next one, please? We can have more discussion, right, before this next motion? Absolutely. Um, because of the definition of structure, I want to let my fellow board members know my thinking. Um, because of the definition of structure, um, it includes something that requires permanent location on the ground or attachment to something having a permanent location on the ground. Everything out there by my vantage looks like it um, could be moved. Okay. And so I don't think it has a permanent location on the ground. Um, and so I think it's not a structure. And the violation that was issued was for the storage of structures. So if we are, I, I still don't know what that use means. I haven't found a commercial district even that allows or disallows that as a use. Um, there are not good definitions around those terms, but structure is defined. Um, storage is not. Storage of structures is not defined. So I think we have to fall back on the definition of a structure. And I don't think that what we see out there um, is a structure based on the definition in the ordinance. Okay. I find that argument persuasive. I mean, the, the not attached to the ground. Is, is that in the form of a motion, sir? Not yet. All right. <laughs> We're, we're still um, talking here. Um, Mr. We take Burkhardt? these in bite size. Pieces? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Burkhardt, do you have any anything you'd like to add to anything Mr. Carrington has no, said? No, I'm in complete concurrence with him. Okay. Yep. Okay, good. Um, All right, now, I'll try you, it again. Let's make Unless this you motion. want to go in there. All right, I'll make a motion. <clears throat> I'm going to try and lump two of them together. I'm going to okay. go for it. Okay. Um, I move to reverse the zoning administrator's determination VIO 2023-109 dated March 3rd, 2023, being appealed as AP 2023-03 Costi Lake. Um, two and four. On violations number two and four, because the of the definitions included in the ordinance of structure and manufactured home. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Is there any discussion? No? Okay. Ms. Ailey, would you please call the roll? Mr. Burkhart? Aye. Mr. Carrington? Aye. Mr. Shepard? No. Ms. Joseph? Aye. <clears throat> Three left. Three is, come on, that's the hard one. Um, so you, you have to have a majority of the board to go against the zoning administrator and you have a majority of the board. So right. number three is reversed. <laughs> well, I think we just haven't gotten there yet. Correct. Or right. number, we're, we're, two, number, two, number two three. Four. It's number Sorry. two and four is reversed. I misspoke. That's right. Three, so we're yeah. on three, yeah. dealing with tires and car parts. Can I take the opportunity to read the definitions of junk and junkyard? Absolutely. 
Junkyard means any land or structure used for the abandonment, bailing, collection, dismantling, maintenance, recycling, sale, salvaging, storage, or wreckage of junk. So it points us back to junk. Junk, as defined in the ordinance, means any scrap, discarded, dismantled, or inoperable vehicles, including parts or machinery thereof, household furniture and appliances, construction equipment and materials, tanks and containers, drums and the contents thereof, and tires, pipes, wire, wood, paper, metals, rags, glass, plastic, food, and related types of waste material. Um, and it's my opinion that, you know, even though there are some very um, close parallels with some of the terms tires, for instance, um, it's my opinion that those need to be discarded. Um, or scrapped in order to be considered junk. Uh, of course, if one of us was storing a tire on our um, parcel, it may not be junk. Could be junk, doesn't have to be junk, in my opinion. 13 either. Sure. <laughs> it may not be 13, 13 tires yeah, either. No, that's right. Okay. Anyway, okay. Uh, any discussion? on the definition not on the definition on the concept just the concept in general i guess um the explanation provided by the appellant um it was straightforward but i'm, I'm now I'm, as uh, mr carrington reads the definition i'm just wondering whether those tires stacked had actually been flat tires or there had been damages to those axles and those are what were taken off to be replaced by something else i guess that's my my confusion with us right now. Mr. Shepard? Uh, I'm torn on this. Uh, I have personal ideas about storing things on your property and not. I think I'm going to presume that the zoning administrator is correct in their in their findings here. Just one more element for me. It, um, there's an element of time involved, right? Um, it it's not in the definition, and so it's um, unwieldy. But to me, I think all of us would agree that um, if something sits there for one minute, it's probably not junk, and then at some point it crosses the threshold, maybe to being junk. Um, we don't have any the luxury of an understanding how long. Um, those axles and tires and other things have have been sitting there. So that is another thing that gives me a little bit of concern as we label it junk. Okay. Are you up for creating another motion? Let somebody else take this oh, one. Come on, you're doing such a wonderful <laughs> job. Mr. Shepard, you ready to create something? Uh, I move that we uphold the zoning administrator's uh, violation number three, which concerns the accumulation of tires and car parts on this parcel, that that the accumulation of tire, tires and car parts on this parcel constitutes a junkyard and is not a permitted use. Okay, is there a second? I will second. Okay, is there any discussion? Okay, Ms. Uh, Mr. Carrington. Hold on, Mr. Shepard, do you wanna say anything more? I didn't no. know you were starting a discussion. Okay, we're gonna call the roll. Did. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt. Are we ready? There's a little bit of a false start. I'm sorry. I... <laughs> sorry about that. Mr. Carrington? No. Mr. Burkhart? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Ms. Joseph? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I expect that at some point in time, Mr. Kostelak, very soon you'll be getting a letter 
that explains exactly what happened here today. And I hope that if you don't understand, please call Mr. Svoboda and he'll, he'll let you know what's going on. Um, and you also know that if uh, you disagree with anything that we've said here and, and you would like to appeal this decision, that you have the right to appeal this to the circuit court. Okay. You had the time limit in uh, for the appeal. I think it's, it's 30 days, I believe. Is that correct, Mr. Bowling? It is 30 days. So thank you. Thank you for everyone uh, showing up. If I had known we were going to be filled, filmed, I would have, you know, dressed better. But anyway, thank you. Um, I also say, I, I hope some of these, uh, the three thing the the three uh Mr. Shepherd items in the three items in the in the violation that uh involved the uh the items on the property. I hope you can work through to some sort of satisfactory uh solution to all of that with the uh zoning staff. That might be uh hope that doesn't sound disingenuous for me to say that, but uh I do hope that that I mean, I, I think I hope we might have more opportunities to sort of cure those problems than the larger question about the forestry. And I really want to thank code compliance staff for showing up. Um, I really appreciate it because these questions were important for you to answer. And we, we, we do support what you're doing. And we do understand when you go on the site, you're not making any um, determinations about anybody personally or anything else. You're just taking pictures of what's out there. So thank you. Okay, we're on to our next item, which is approval of the minutes. Does anyone have any comments? I think I do, but I can't find them yet. Oh, okay. Mr. Shepard, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, in general, I want to say, uh, you know, we've been talking about uh, making the, the minutes uh, shorter to the point. Uh, and these were a masterpiece in that regard. Uh, I almost, you know, want to say, well, that's not, you know, I want more, I want less. I don't want to quibble, uh, but with the uh, the home occupation uh, minutes, I would, without getting into great detail uh, in any kind of uh, you know verbatim report, I would like it to just be noted, and it could be in as short as one sentence that we had a discussion about what uh, what kind of review would be done under a ministerial review. Uh, and as I say, we don't need to get into all the, the back and forth on that, but I'd just like to memorialize that this was a, that that was a, to me, it was a big issue. And it, uh, it uh, I'd like to just get that in there. I would hope we could, approve the minutes with the understanding that uh you no know, ministerial review can be in inserted into the minutes in a sentence or two just to uh document that the discussion happened you'll need to be very writing. precise about where you want that and what you want stated well i want i don't want anything stated that that wasn't said there was I think it was a good couple of minutes back and forth in the discussion about that. Can't there just be a sentence? I mean, John, take a look through there and think where you might be inserted, but it can just be a sentence that said there was discussion about ministerial review. That would do it. I can't find it in the minutes because there's no mention of it. I mean, it's just, it's a blank spot. Well, try to remember where we where we were when you were talking about it and stick it in there. I think um, I talked to... Maybe Bart can help me remember. I think I was both uh, Mr. Zavoda and Mr. Herrick weighed in on that. And we were there was just some back and forth about it, but it's just 
that that a discussion occurred is all that's important to me. It's not who had the best ideas. Yeah, if I may, maybe I can propose that we uh, defer approval of the minutes okay. till next meeting. Okay. Um, we do have a variance, I believe. Is that correct, Marsha? August and September. Yep, August and September. So we're going to have meetings in a row. So we're not going to have a big gap. Excellent. Okay. So I'm not suggesting we wait till say December to approve these. Um, so um, what I'm that will give us an opportunity from the staff level to go back identify in the recording. We'll do our best to identify in the recording where that took place and and come up with a summary to be inserted in the minutes for y'all to look at at okay. the next I, meeting. I appreciate that. And it can really be uh, brief, but just literally to that extent. Yes, sir. Understood. Thank does, you. Does anyone else have any? Okay. I have just a couple little tiny little things here. Um, page two, line four. And it says, made an error and caused the following harms. And then there's no list of what the following harms are. I don't quite know what was going on there. Um, page two, uh, line 19. And selling guns was in three to six miles of two elementary, what, schools, I think. Um, schools. Um, so that's that's all I found, and um, yeah, these these were lovely. I didn't have to spend four hours. It was a wonderful <laughs> thing. So I, I think that uh, she's getting the essence, which is really hard to do if you're not here. So I appreciate that. So do we have do we have to vote if we're going to defer these minutes or? Do you know Miss Haley? Yeah, I think it would be appropriate to vote to defer. Well, I'm not advising. I just think if you so choose to defer the minutes, it would probably be best to do that in a vote. Okay. Do we have a motion to defer the minutes to our next meeting? I'd like to make a motion that we defer the minutes uh, of the um, June 6, 2023 meeting of the Board of Zoning Appeals until the next scheduled meeting in August. Thank you. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Any further discussion? No. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Alley, would you please call the roll? Mr. Burkhart? Yes. Mr. Shepard? Yes. Mr. Carrington? Yes. Ms. Joseph? Yes. Okay. The next item on the agenda is old business. And one thing I'd like to bring up. Pardon? What? You're doing the second set of minutes. I'm sorry. Well, they're they're all in Part one the place. They're all the same. Oh, okay. Um. Okay. Sorry, guys. The next is old business, and we've been mm -hmm. talking about uh, motions and and creating motions that are um. Well, actually, the, the motions that give us the most difficulty are the appeals if we are deciding against um, supporting the zoning administrator. Uh, we have been discussing this with Mr. Bowling, and um, Mr. Carrington and I both met with staff and talked about motions and how to create these motions. And uh, we appreciate the um, all the research that the staff has done looking at how the Planning Commission acts and how the Board of Supervisors act, but we're just a little bit of a different body here. So one of the, the good pieces of information that we received from our attorney, Mr. Bowling, was that because we are so different, we really need to be able to um, explain with our motion exactly why we did this. Because oftentimes, if this does go to court, the judge is going to be looking at that particular part of what they receive. And so we don't want to have to have the judge to wade through and look at what our discussion was. We want the judge to know exactly why we made these decisions. So that's that's what we've come up with um, following the ad advice of our wonderful attorney that we're working with, Mr. Bowling. 
So I wanted you guys to know that. Is there, does anyone else want to add anything to that? No? Okay. That's that's when you reverse the decision. Yes. It's when we fine were... when you affirm to just call it a day if you want to. Right. So I just wanted to let you guys know what was going on with us and, and the decisions that, that we had made. So thank you. Thank you for pursuing that. We really appreciate it. Um, on the new business is, I would like to have a really short discussion with the board because we've got to be out of here at four, right? Is that right? We, yeah, we are scheduled in front of the PC today. Okie doke. Which is um, unusual. All right. So one of the things that I would like us to pursue is um, asking the court if they would choose a couple of alternates for us. And that is allowed by the code, by the code of Virginia, allows us to request mm -hmm. the um, circuit court to appoint alternates. And the more I think about this, the more I like the idea because um, BCA always has really old people like me sitting on it. And it'd be really nice if we had some alternates who are like young people. And at that point, um, oh, they nice. could they could, <laughs> they could come up because then when when the old people retired, then you could get these people who actually had some experience move up from being an, an alternate to an actual board member. So if you guys agree with me that you wanna do something like this, we can ask staff to do a little bit of research and find out how it might be done. If you don't wanna do it, that's fine. I just thought that we're getting to the point where I, I don't like tie votes. Um, and I, I think it really does a disservice to the the applicant to staff because it's sort of like, well, we really didn't make a decision. Um, so anyway, Mr. Shepard. Question, would this be uh, for uh, just individual uh, absences? Or like I remember Mr. Reinhardt uh, would be out of town for months at a time. Uh, and an alternate for him during that period would have been great. Uh, and we've had, you know, we've had absences in the last couple of months. Last month in particular was significant. Uh, and an alternate that uh, on that particular case would have been helpful to avoid the tie vote. Uh, so is this for individual meetings or a defined <laughs> period of time or no, it's, it's just it's an alternate it's like if you're not here somebody will sit in for you that's the way i understand like it for one me one yep. meeting at a time okay that, yep. that's what i wanted to make yep. sure of. yep and so let me get this straight that uh the agenda packet would then be shared with obviously the alternate because they would have to be well versed coming in to be able to make a decision on behalf of the person who would in advance said, uh, I won't be at this meeting for X, Y, and Z reasons, right? And so would there be a, a, a pecking order uh, in terms of, you know, we've got a list of uh, people, we could just go down the list and give everybody an opportunity uh, to sit in as an, as an alternate? That sounds like a great idea because then you'd give everybody experience. Sure. Yeah. Actually, that could become part of our policy, whatever we call it. On a rotating, yeah. Yeah. Rotata yeah, rotating invite, right? Yeah. Because some yeah. invariably some of them are going to be unable to <laughs> unable to attend um, when they're asked to serve right. as an alternate. I would vote for a, or I would request a shorter list, you know, of two or three, not mm -hmm. ten. Yeah, oh, we um, can't do ten. We can only do three. Okay, we can only do three. So, um, right. so yeah, I mean, it's... even one I think would accomplish the vast majority of good that we're hoping it would. So uh, would like to uh, propose this as a motion that we just pursue this yes yes okay would you like, like to the idea. Um, i move that we request that staff uh is that and, what... and, and, can, and we'll work with mr bowling on this too i assume yes 
Well, I think you want to make sure staff is on board and also check in with the Board, board of, supervisors of Supervisors to make sure okay. that okay. they uh, um, throw in their two cents worth. I think it, but ultimately, it looks like, and just par parsing the statute pretty quickly as you spoke, it looks like the, 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 the court can appoint up to three alternate members yes. of the BZA who fill in as pinch hitters when one of the regular members knows they're going to be absent and so notifies the chairman within, what is it, 24 hours of the meeting? It is 24 hours. So, um, and which is the other thing, if any of <clears> you are not going to be available, tell me. I know people have been telling Ms. Alley, but really the code says to tell me. And if I know, then I can call the rest of you and make sure that we have a quorum. Okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, I move that we, we request the staff to uh, investigate the possibility of uh, having alternate BZA members okay. of, of, of asking the court to appoint alternate BZA members for the purpose of avoiding uh, lack of quorum or lack of uh, lack of a full quorum. Um, and, and understand, I'll just add this, if I may, that it, that uh, when, when the board votes to reverse the uh, zoning administrator, you need a majority of the full board, not just a majority of, of the of the members present. Right, mm -hmm. right. So it wouldn't be like if we have three alternatives, it wouldn't be eight, right? It would it would always be based on five. That's right. Okay. So you have to have three vote in the affirm vote in the affirmative for reversal. Regardless but, of how many alternates there might be. Well, you don't. You only call an alternate, as I understand. And again, I'm just parsing the statute pretty quickly right here. You only call an alternate when a member knows he's going to be absent, or he knows he's going to have to likely abstain okay. on a particular issue. Okay. So, so we, that's that's my off the cuff reading very quickly. I figure out those details, but right, and and that's. I mean, when I saw this, I got very excited. So I thought, let's see if we can even pursue this. Um, so we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I will second that motion. All right. Any further discussion on this? Okay. Thanks for your work on that. Thank you yeah, about absolutely. it. Is Miss Alley, would you please call the roll? Mr. Shepard? Aye. Mr. Carrington? Aye. Mr. Burkhart? Aye. Ms. Joseph? Aye. Okay. Is there any other new business that anyone would like to discuss? Well, on the note of absences, I've uh, been in contact with our chair about um, missing. I'll be traveling for personal reasons uh, during the next variance meet. Well, the next meeting, which I understand has a variance, um, and I think that we have the provisions for me to participate to, virtually. Um, yeah. And if that's desired, I'd be happy to do that. And if not, uh, if the variance is such that it's more complicated for me to join um, and there still can be a quorum without me, then I'm happy to abstain if it complicates it more than it helps. Um, I just, I, I will speak for myself, but I probably, I think the other board members would agree is, is your input is always important and welcome. And I mean, you really do help us craft these things. So thank you. So I will, ask maybe that we can have that on our radar collectively to try and figure out how to do that. I don't know that at this moment, uh, how to participate virtually. I'll get in touch with the IT and we'll make that happen. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carrington. Is there anything else? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make that a motion to adjourn uh, the meeting of um, July 11th, 2023. Second? I second that. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 No one is opposed. <laughs> okay. It's not a split decision. No. <laughs> no we'd How have long to do we have to stay here? <laughs> split decision. <laughs>